Well, hopefully you've had a chance to find your spot there in the book of Philippians. Let's all stand together and stretch for just a minute uh, before we head into this passage of Scripture. Philippians chapter number 2. And we're going to read a number of verses tonight, but for tonight, uh, for our Scripture reading, we'll read uh, beginning in verse number 15, just one verse, uh, and then we'll have a word of prayer. Philippians 2 verse 15. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for the music that we have heard tonight, but more than that, for the testimonies, for the message through song, and how you've touched our lives. God, I just pray that you would speak to us now through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. One of the things I love about Lancaster Baptist School now as a parent is I love attending awards ceremonies. And throughout the year, sometimes I'll get an email that one of our kids is going to be recognized in a chapel service. So we'll mark it off on the calendar. We'll be here. And it's fun to see. And you're you're proud of your child. And everyone wants to see their child do well. And I think that's kind of universal across the board. But I think that's growing as well. I think think people really want their kids to to stand out. In fact, I uh, came across an article earlier this month Uh, that said even the way that people choose their baby uh, names have changed. And the article was entitled, The Age of the Unique Baby Name. It said parents want their kids, used to want their kids to fit in, now they want them to stand out. Uh, I remember my wife and I going through baby books and going through uh, different websites trying to select the baby names. And every time we talked about a name, uh, Ashley would always say, well, someone already else has this name. And I tell her, Ashley, we go to a really big church. Someone else is going to have the name. Let's just pick someone who's not weird. And that's OK. We can go and we can match names with someone else. But she did a really great job. I love our girls and I love their names. But this article said uh, that if you are between the years 1880 and 1961, uh, for all but six of those years, the number one girl's name was Mary. Every year, all but six years during that span of time, Mary was the popular name. In 1950s, uh, if you take the 1950s, for example, half of all American babies were born had just a, of just a pool of about 78 names, a lot of common names. And maybe a lot of you went to school with someone else that shared your name. The article said today's, it's a little different. Parents are thinking about naming their kids more like how companies think about naming products, which is kind of competitive marketplace where you need to be able to get attention to succeed. And so people uh, and some parents are thinking of, uh, well, what name can, uh, can best be searched in a Google search engine? Or what name can I find that an email address will even be available for them to to choose uh, when it's time to get one. But I thought it was interesting. The article ended with this. All this has brought us to an era of an exceptionally varied names, which in a way represents its own kind of conformity. And here's what it says. The last sentence said, trying not to be like everyone else makes you just like everyone else. (laughs) Trying not to be like everyone else makes you just like everyone else. Well, I'm thankful for a night like tonight, and I'm thankful for when we come to Scripture that we can find how to raise a generation and how we can be a generation that is distinct in the world. And as we read in Scripture, that we can shine forth against a dark backdrop and, and difficult times. How can we be different? And the irony is everyone's trying to be different, and yet little and few are making an actual difference. And so we find here in Philippians chapter 2 how we can be the light in the world and how we can go into the darkness. That ye may be blameless and harmless and sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, Paul wrote this, uh, this book of Philippians, and he first came to Philippi, and we read of this in the book of Acts, and it's been some years uh, have passed since Paul himself was in Phil- Philippi. Philippi itself is a Roman colony, but now Paul is imprisoned. In fact, if you read through chapter number one, you can read again and again that Paul mentions that he is in bonds, and yet in bonds, he continues to preach the gospel. He would, have been, uh, he would have been handcuffed to the Petrarian guard and a, a rotating guard. And everyone that came in, Paul preached the gospel to. So even in that situation, the gospel was furthered, verse number 12 of chapter number 1. And Paul's attitude was this, as you read through chapter 1, if I'm released, great. 
I'll continue to preach Christ. But for me to die is gain. So he's torn. He even says he'd rather be with Christ, uh, but he's ready to die and he's able to live. But then he gets to verse number 24 and he says that there is something that there is needful. So he's ready to preach the gospel. He's ready to go home to glory. But he recognizes this church, this Philippian church, which, by the way, they had sent Epaphroditus to give an offering to this church. So this, this is a church that loved and cared for the Apostle Paul. Uh, but, but there was something that was needful for the Apostle Paul to convey to them. These were some of his stronger, strongest supporters. And yet he gives them the message here in Philippians. A few verses uh, uh, towards the end of Philippians chapter number one. In fact, the theme verse for our church, we read, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And so what Paul is going to do is help these believers understand what it means to live out the gospel and to live out the truth of God's word. And he's reminding them and he's challenging, challenging them to be that light in the world. And this is his heart, uh, to have a life that is becoming of the gospel. We'll end up here in just a minute in verse number 15 where we started. Uh, but, but we find those, those words in this verse, the, the crooked and perverse generation. We don't have to look very far to find crookedness and, and perverseness in our society. Crookedness speaks to uh, the, 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 the bent of someone to break rules or to bend laws in order to benefit self. And of course, we know the no, name of a crook, someone that'll steal take someone else to disadvantage them to advantage themselves. Uh, the perverse nation, this is a distortion of truth. And boy, do we see that this ever, ever present today. And it's easy for us to get worked up about a wicked, perverse, corrupt, and crooked generation. We don't have to look very far, but that's not where Paul is going to direct our attention tonight. In the book of Hebrews, we read, For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher from the than the heavens. And so Paul is going to direct our attention to Jesus. The one who is blameless calls us to be blameless. The one who is with no guile calls us to walk as light, children of light in the world. And you can't extinguish the darkness without light. So how is this accomplished in our life? How is this practically realized in the school? We're going to get to the practical aspects of it first, but where Paul begins is with the motivation of it. And I want you to notice a few things in this portion of this letter that where our attention is drawn to. First, we see an appeal for unity. There is an appeal for unity. Verse number one of Philippians chapter two. If there be any consolation in Christ... If any comfort of love, if any fellowship in the spirit, if any bowels of mercy. Now, these four ifs are affirmative statements. Paul is not questioning if they had experienced the consolation, the love, the comfort. These are believers. This is a saved audience receiving this. So he is rehearsing what God has done for them. He's helping them to establish their spiritual bearings. That's important for us to do as well. Sometimes we can all get worked up about something or frustrated about something else. What Paul is doing before he is going to challenge them and, and, and prompt them and, and, and growth and knowledge of Christ, he's going to give them bearings for what God had done in their life. They had experienced the encouragement and love, but not everyone... And Philippi was an ardent supporter of the Apostle Paul. You read in verses number 15 and 16 and 17 of chapter number 1, and you can just glance over there with me. Paul said, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. strife. That word envy is speaking of jealousy, and that jealousy leads to strife. And some of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add to my affliction or to add to affliction to my bonds. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. I love Paul's attitude there. Not everyone was for him. Not everyone was kind. Some people, according to this passage, had the right message, but they had the wrong motivation. They had the wrong spirit. But Paul, uh, with maturity, Christian maturity, says, I'm glad for every opportunity that the gospel has to get out. Amen. So there were certainly at this time external threats to Christianity and the gospel, and yet it flourished. The greater threat to the church has always come from within. Uh, an abandonment of truth, a distortion of truth, an abandonment of good doctrine. 
or disunity. If Christians are going to be the light that God desires us to be, we must be united together. And what unites us? The gospel. Look at verse number two. Paul said, fulfill ye my joy. What Paul's saying here is like, you know what would make you really happy? And by the way, the theme of the book of Philippians is joy. We find it all throughout the book. But, but Paul says, fulfill ye my joy. This would make me really happy. I remember as a kid, sometimes I would go to my mom and I would say, Mom, what do you want for Christmas? And she would say something like, I just want you and your brother to get along. <laughs> and I'd say, what else do you want, Mom? <laughs> That's kind of a motherly to say, this is, this is just one thing. This would make me really happy if you did this, you know. Well, Paul is speaking kind of as a spiritual parent. He's saying, fulfill ye my joy. And what was it that was going to fulfill his joy? It wasn't his release from prison. It wasn't an easier situation. But Paul says, who, who is a man who already has such incredible joy. But he says, you know what would make me even happier? That ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, and of one mind. Do you remember Philippi in Acts chapter number 16? What is it that unites an upscale businesswoman, a slave girl with a troubled past, a tough-nosed jailer and his family? It's the gospel. The church is made up of natural enemies. What binds us together is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs. Or anything else, Christians come together because they have been saved by Jesus Christ. They are a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. Verse number three says, But let nothing, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You see, unity is achieved when we direct our concern towards others. The music tonight was incredible, and I was actually blown away by the orchestra of Lancaster Baptist School. Maybe I've heard it before, but man, I don't ever remember it quite being as good as that. But one time there was a conductor that was asked, a conductor of a symphony, he, he was asked, what is the most difficult instrument to play or defined to play in the orchestra? And he responded, the second violin. He said, I can find plenty of first violinists, but to find someone that can play the second violin with enthusiasm, that's a problem. And if we have no second violin, we have no harmony. To be like-minded is clear. If you, if you study Paul, because he uses this word elsewhere in scripture, to be like-minded is to be Christ-minded. Um, like-mindedness is not me trying to convince you to think like me. And it's not you trying to convince me to think like you. And it's not a school trying to get you to conform to these rules and a parent trying to get the school to see this way. Like-mindedness is achieved when we pursue the mind of Christ. And so Christian unity is achieved when believers put on the mind of Christ. And this wasn't just, uh, 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 this wasn't just a concern for the church at Philippi. Paul also spoke to the church at Corinth and he, he said, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Back in uh, the summer of 1969, there was a, a pilot named Dale Black, and Dale Black uh, took off from Burbank Airport, the Burbank Hollywood Airport, and as soon as he took off, uh, he noticed that something was wrong, and the plane began to violently rattle. It, it never really reached uh, full potential of altitude. It only reached about 100 feet. It only traveled a few hundred yards, and it eventually crashed, crashed not far from the Burbank Airport. Uh, there's a monument there to Amelia Earhart, and this is the portal of the portal of folded wings. And Dale Black crashed into that portal. He ended up living and he said, he tells the story. He said the problem that he had with the planes that were that the propellers were out of sync. And if a propeller on an airplane becomes out of sync, the plane will begin to vibrate. And if that synchronization becomes greater, eventually like Dale Black experienced, the crane, the train, uh, the, the plane will crash. Uh, to the right is a, uh, a, a prop synchronization indicator. A lot of prop airplanes will have that because if the propellers are not in sync, the plane will crash. And let me tell you this, when we are not in sync with each other, with our family, with our spouse, with the school, if we're not like-minded around uh, uh, the mind of Christ, there is friction. How can two walk together except they be agreed? 
By this shall men know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Listen, I'm thankful for I'm thankful for the local church and I'm thankful uh, for this admonition for us, even even a great church like Lancaster Baptist Church, to continually remind ourselves to develop the mind of Christ and to be united together around the gospel, to be like minded. So Paul begins with a prayer for unity, but then he moves on and gives us an example of humility to further understand what it means to have lowliness of mind and put the mind of Christ on. He gives us an example, and we are to observe the mind of Christ. So what does it mean to be like-minded? Verse number five, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And there's a lot we can say about this passage. And I was reading through a commentary this week and uh, the guy who wrote the commentary said, I would guess that there are hundreds and hundreds of volumes that are written just on the next few verses that we will read tonight. But I want to draw your attention to a few things. First of all, Christ did not become humble. What we find here in this passage is that Christ, Jesus was eternally humble, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. It's been said that the Greeks did not have such a word for humility. The concept was entirely uh, foreign to the Greeks and utterly abhorrent to the Romans. The word for humility was coined when the church was birthed. And and so uh, Paul uh, challenges them here to let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And he draws their attention to the example of Christ's humility. The fact that God clothed himself in humanity, that Jesus clothed himself in humanity and became flesh. This happens, and I think it's helpful for us to to look at this a few different ways. This happens without confusion. God being man, this happens without confusion. Meaning, this is not God, uh, Jesus, coming to earth, uh, taking upon himself the form of the uh, servant, happens without confusion. Meaning, Jesus isn't what you get when you you mix two colors together and then you get Jesus. Uh, That's not what happened. This happens without change. Uh, Meaning, uh, the incarnation affected no substantial change in the divine son. So uh, think of a butterfly, which was a caterpillar. Now it's a butterfly. Uh, Jesus isn't just a new change, a metamorphosis of something else. He didn't stop becoming, uh, being what he was to become who, uh, uh, take on the form of a servant. This happens without division. Uh, Christ is not uh, half God, half man. This happens without separation. There's not a little bit of overlap where, where sometimes he could be God and sometimes he could be man. Uh, some sort of a, a sympathetic relationship No, Jesus was truly God and truly man, fully God and fully man. Jesus, the Son of God, assumed all limitations of infinite humanity while he remained fully God and fully man. And made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. Death by crucifixion was intentionally cruel, but it was also intentionally humiliating. There was no other more humiliating way to die. But but mark it down that Jesus humbled himself. Jesus was not humbled by the Romans. or He was not humbled by uh, the Jews who cried for his death or by Pilate or by anyone else. Jesus humbled himself. A little lower than the angels, the Bible tells us. So he existed in humility in eternity past. And then we see the humility of his incarnation. And in this passage, the humility, ultimately, his death on the cross. I read recently that Edmund Hillary, uh, the first to climb Mount Everest, when he reached the top of Mount Everest, he removed the snow for the few minutes that he was there. And he took a cross and he put a cross into the snow and he buried it. Just a side note, his companion Tenzing uh, brought chocolate and he put chocolate in the snow and buried it. So maybe that's your spiritual level, right? Uh, But Edmund Hillary, why would he do that? Someone gave that to him. I don't know if there's an account that he's actually a Christian, but I think it's interesting if you think of what the cross was. The cross was a symbol of shame. So how could something that the Romans wouldn't even speak of a symbol of shame becomes something that was placed on the pinnacle here on earth. How could something that 
uh, was such a symbol of death become a symbol of hope? Because of the exaltation of Jesus Christ. Wherefore, read in verse number nine, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. The word highly exalted is one word in the Greek, and this is the only time in Scripture you will find this word, this super exaltation, that God highly exalted him. No one else in all time lowered themselves as much as Jesus did and was exalted as much as Jesus was. That In verse number 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things of earth and things under the earth, that every tongue. So if you like to mark your Bibles, here's a few good things to mark. Every knee and every tongue, everyone will confess in humble submission or broken confession that Jesus is Lord. That's our perspective as Christians. One day, everyone will confess. And who is everyone? Well, it says here in this passage, all things in heaven. Every angel that was ever created, every demon that was ever cast down, everyone on earth, everyone who has ever lived and all things under the earth, anyone who has ever lived and passed on, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow and exalt and proclaim that Jesus is Lord. We were at a church member's house early on in December and we were, the, we were in the backyard it was rather cold, and uh, we were looking at some Christmas lights and having a good time. Uh, but my brother-in-law, John, had this look on his face and said, what is that? And we looked up to the sky, and I saw this trail of lights up in the sky. And I had no idea what it was. I think we've got a picture here. And we were looking out and taking pictures of it. It was one of the most bizarre things that I had ever seen. And so I, I, I went to Twitter to see what Twitter said it was, you know. And I looked at it, and eventually reading online, I found out pretty soon this was a Starlink Elon Musk uh, volley of satellites that had just been launched into space. And they get wider as they, uh, as they, uh, as they get uh, higher into space. I was amazed by that. My kids came running. I thought it worked out perfect that it was December. I told them it was Santa Claus. And uh, <laughs> it was convincing. We, we, we looked at it, though, and, and it was, it was, I was in awe of it, actually. Uh, the technology, the Starlink satellite that's going to bring, even right now, it's bringing internet to the people of Ukraine, you might have read. It it's kind of blows your mind. So as Ashley and I left that night, we were, we were talking about that. I was texting uh, some of my extended family and friends and telling them, you know what we saw tonight? Was, it was kind of neat. It was the first time to see it. I'm sure I'll see it again, but it was pretty neat to be in awe. When's the last time you've been in awe? And when's the last time you've been in awe over the verses we just read? If we went out tonight and I saw those satellites, it'd be pretty cool, but the awe would be diminished. I've seen it before. I think if we're not careful as Christians, we read these verses and we think, I've seen it before. I've been there before. I know this already. When's the last time that you were in awe of the fact that God emptied himself, not, not, not by becoming anything less, but by taking, he emptied by taking the form of a servant. To live, to, to suffer, to bleed, to, 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 to bear infirmities, to be mocked and beaten and scourged. When's the last time you were in all of that, that he did that for you? If we're going to be different makers, if we're going to be difference makers, we're drawn to the humility of Christ, the self-humiliation, the divine exaltation. You see why? Because that serves as our daily motivation. We find this prayer for unity, an example of, uh, for unity, an example of humility, but notice finally with me, a holy responsibility. Look at verse number 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. This is interesting. Paul commends the Philippians for their obedience, but he says what every student in here already knows. The test of a class is how the class behaves when the teacher leaves. That's what Paul's saying here. So you did well, you obey well in my presence, but how about in my absence? And by the way, let me tell you, the point is Lancaster Baptist School, uh, the purpose of it extends well beyond graduation. 
I think far too many high school students live uh, with, with just the yearbook in mind and the yearbook years, the high school years. Can I tell you, high school, junior high moves by quickly. Uh, the prayer and hope of Lancaster Baptist School is to prepare you for life. And that's what Paul is saying here. Is like, I'm not always with you. You're not always going to have a teacher with you. You're not always going to have uh, supervision with you. But hopefully you have a worldview and scripture and the tools to go into the darkness and be the light. Verse number 12, wherefore, my beloved brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now in my absence. And then Paul says this, work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation. I had a teacher one time that would put a problem on the board and then he'd put the problem and then he'd leave and say, you, you guys work it out. And that didn't always go well for me. Sometimes I would try and sometimes it would work out and sometimes it wouldn't work out. Is that what Paul is saying here when he says work out your own salvation? Well, let me, I'll explain what he means, but let me say what he doesn't mean. He doesn't mean to work for your salvation. Your standing with God, uh, we find in verse number one that we read a moment ago, that comfort, that love, that fellowship, you'll find the words that Paul used frequently in Christ. So your salvation is secure, not because you worked something out, but because Christ did something for you on the cross of Calvary. And so that is our standing with God. And so it doesn't mean to work for your salvation. Jonathan Edwards said, we bring nothing to salvation except for the need of it. Paul wrote in Ephesians, and you know the verse, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So he's not saying work out your salvation or work for your salvation. Salvation, sometimes we, we, we think first and primarily of our eternal salvation. And, 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 and I, uh, that's understandable. We rejoice when someone gets saved and we, we look back on our salvation in the moment we accepted Christ. But salvation in scripture is represented in three ways. First of all, justification. That moment when you were declared right before God. Uh, then there's glorification. When we are in glory, eventual glorification uh, with, with God in heaven. But what happens between justification and glorification? Sanctification. And that's what Paul is referring to when he says, work out your salvation. Now, by the way, you can't work out what's not in. Thought about naming this message in and out, right? Because it's got to be in before it can get out. And so to work for your salvation, to work out or to work from your salvation, it was what Paul is challenging uh, these individuals to do. Spurgeon said in a sermon, uh, I think based in the book of Joshua, he, he said that God's promises are not a couch to sit upon, you, you, but a girdle wherewith to gird up the loins for future activity. Uh, Matthew Henry said, observe then what me, we may expect God to meet us with mercy when we are found in the way of duty. And I believe the word work here is intentional because there is responsibility on our part. G.K. Chesterton said that Christian faith has not been found tried and wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. It's work. It's work. Human responsibility is one side of the coin, but the other side, and that's daunting, but the other side of the coin we'll find if you continue reading, and that is the divine activity of God through you. Look at verse number 13. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So work out your own salvation, but it is him that works through you. It is God that works in and through you, both the will and the do uh, from God. <laughs> I heard a story about uh, a, a man that went to the, the Venice Beach where the famous bodybuilders are. And I think we've got a few pictures of this guy. This old guy went to Venice Beach and all these, if you've ever seen pictures of, I've never been there, but uh, I've seen pictures of these big bodybuilders who go and they lift these weights on the beach. And if you're, you're really strong, you go and you lift these weights. Well, this guy came and asked if he could join these guys lifting weights. And they're a little reluctant. I think we've got a few slides here that we'll just kind of circle through. The next one shows him actually going and lifting a little bit of weights and everyone's kind of surprised. And then uh, the next one here, he's actually starts to challenge some of these guys to a little competition. And I don't know if there's another slide there. Those are, that's a 45 pound bar and 45 pound. And, and, and here, here, here was the deal. The man was named Kenneth Levereth. He's the former junior heavy lifting champion. He could do a, a 535 pound deadlift. And some, it was a prank. They dressed him up to look like an old man. He went and challenged all the young guys and then he beat them. <laughs> and these guys were scratching their head. He lifts that and then he just threw it down and walked off. And these guys are like, what in the world? 
Why, why is it so confusing to them? Because they look at the flesh and the flesh is, is weak and it's fragile. It's like, what, what has become of that? Can I tell you something about us? Our flesh is, is weak. And in our own strength, we can't do it. Our, our flesh is frail. It is weak. And you should have no confidence in your flesh. Uh, the, Paul said this in the next uh, chapter. He says, he's, and have no confidence in the flesh, right? If your spirit is, I can do this. I can make this happen. My sanctification, I got it, God. Let me surprise you. I'm going to do it. It's all going to be good. I got this. If that's your attitude, uh, th that's what we heard this morning, self-righteousness. So Paul said, I have no confidence in my flesh. But here's what he did have confidence in. If you look in verse number six of chapter number one, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It is Christ in us and through us that enable us to shine as lights in the world. It's because he went to the cross of Calvary and the sky was darkened uh, that we can now shine as lights in this world. So how do we do that? Let's end very practically. Look at verse number, verse number, well, let's finish reading verse number 13. For it's God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I love those words there, good pleasure. God's got a good plan for you. And God can accomplish great things through you, not because of you, but in spite of you. And then you read verse number 14. So this is where it gets practical. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Sean, thanks for not having everyone raise their hands. <laughs> this, is the, this is the line, the drop-off line. These are the things that we all have things that, that bug us. And, and so you say, well, is that what he's talking about? It says all things. All things. As believers, how can we be light in this world? Well, it starts with our attitude. All things. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Murmuring is that grumbling, that under your breath, disputing those contentious debates, which, which we all seem to be able to find ourselves in these days. So do all things without murmurings and disputings. And then verse number 15, which we began with, that you may be blameless and harmless sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Then how do you do that? How do you shine as lights in the world? Look at verse number 16. Holding forth the word of life. So how can you shine as lights in the world? First of all, speak words of life. It says that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I've not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Speak words of life. Speak the gospel. Then serve in humility. Look at verse number 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon sacrifice and, and service of your faith, I, re, I joy and rejoice with you all. He commends them for their service, but compels them to continue serving. If you want to be a light in this world, if you want to be a difference and be a difference maker and dispel, dispel the darkness, serve with humility. Uh, Paul said, you know, everyone... Uh, he said later in this passage, I can't find anyone, and he commends Timothy, but I can't find anyone else that's like-minded. Why? Because everyone serves their own interest. Serve others and expect nothing in return. You want to be a difference in the world? Find someone to serve. You'll never run out of people to serve. And then share in the joy. He says, I, your service of faith, I joy and rejoice with you. I read this report this week studying for this message, that joy truly is contagious. And here you have the Apostle Paul. He's in a situation where you wouldn't think he'd find any joy, and yet he's got the joy of the Lord in his heart. And that joy, he's compelling and he's sharing. And let me tell you something. When God is truly doing something in your heart and you experience the joy, not based in circumstances, but based on the truths that we read tonight, that joy is contagious. Share the words of life, serve others, and then share in that joy. There's a project in New Zealand, uh, Brother Bale, called the, the Dark, Dark Sky Project. And the Dark Sky Project uh, is, is trying to combat light pollution. We all know what light pollution is. Light pollution is when you're in the city and you look up to the stars and you can't see any stars. The reason is, is there's too much light. And since there's too much light, you can't see the star, stars. And so there's this sky project is trying to find places where they can keep the, 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 the light pollution to a minimum. So that way you can get out and you can still, like the men boys camp out, we look up and we see the stars, you know. And then they say the problem is that there's too much light. 
Let me tell you this, that Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. But our world could use some more light. Amen. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your heavenly father. Trying not to be like everyone else makes you just like everyone else. Junior hires, high schoolers, all of us. The world doesn't need more of the same. Let's be the light. Let's go into the darkness for the glory of God.